Uh, okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, tonight is the, what day is today? It's the December 12th. Uh, we've got a, a few hearings uh, scheduled for tonight. Before we get into those, uh, at the beginning of each meeting, we have a public comment section. Uh, uh, if you have any opinions or statements you want to make about something that doesn't have anything to do with the hearings that we're about to hear uh, or review, if you can raise your hand and come up to the podium, and we'll start with you. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Steve Callahan. I live at 824 First Pit Road. I sent all of you a letter on Monday. I don't know if you can see them. I had some problem delivering my first letters. But uh, I requested an appeal of your decision to approve the amendment to the first part plan on October 24th. I submitted that on the 12th of November, so it being listed on your agenda and have a chance to talk about it, it never showed up on your agenda. I looked at the agenda today, it didn't show up again. I received no communication from anyone, but I just want to enter the facts that I sent on to you in the letter, and these are facts, these are not my opinions. Okay? The number one fact is that the mayor and Mr. Feige signed off on lots one, two, and 10 before the purchase even occurred. So they never had a 10 lot plan. They were in control of seven lots. They produced a 10 lot plan and asked you to vote on it before they even purchased it. Okay? The 10 lot plan happened to include lots 1, 2, and 10. Those ones they had no control. And coincidentally, when the plan came back for water management, lots 1, 2, and 10 were listed, you know, we didn't own them, and they prevented any building at all going on lots 3 to 8. I know that's hard to believe, okay? But it happened, okay? A few other things in terms of the whole project, okay? I think it's called, what, an open space cluster development. I've got a letter from the director here, or assistant director, saying you need a four acre minimum to qualify that, four. They only had, well, they claimed they had 2.67, but once you take out the three lots that they gave away before they purchased, you're down to about 1.82 acres, less than half. Okay, but it was approved. Okay, uh, then it came back for an amendment. And if you think an amendment, at least from the people I've talked to, changes the total number of units, okay, from 13, goes into uh, zoning that would require two lots when the single zoning area. I mean, that's more than I think a minor adjustment to the plan. Finally, on the recommendation, Ms. Mitch, you approved three houses to and lots, I think they're all three, the back of the ball. You approved them as accessory apartments upon this Mrs. recommendation. And my understanding is an accessory apartment is owner occupied. Owner occupied, not a six unit development at the back of the block. They were approved individually, okay? Not in the meeting because somebody points it out. So that's an accessory, lot three of them, they're there, okay? But so all of these things, bang, 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 they look terrible. They don't look terrible, they really smell terrible. All the way down the line. And if you can say, okay, don't worry about it, we'll take half the size for a cluster lot. Don't worry about it, we'll approve accessory housing, even if it's not owner occupied. Because you trust in the people who, I mean, believe me, I've been confused as heck on all of these things I'm trying to find and catch up on, okay? You've got to be able to trust the people who are coming to you with recommendations. You add this to the fact that there was a quote unquote, I'm going to call it a secret meeting. That was when Ms. Mish deliberately left off the agenda item that the transfer, you're going to transfer some units from Emerson Way, high on the hill, and you're going to transfer them to the back of Birch Bog, and Birch Bog was never mentioned. The specific listing was we're going to transfer units, period, and then at Emerson Way, okay? It was deceptive. 
there's been nothing but deceptive actions. A couple of people who have been injured, when I say injured and damaged, I'm talking about losing thousands of dollars in lawyers trying to fight this mess, okay? As well as probably going without sleep for a year and a half of the aggravation of what they're going through. People have been hurt. And the votes, continually, the votes on this lot don't line up with the laws. They don't line up with the city's policies. And I would ask, before any money is changed, because it's going to be a whole different game once you start swapping money, okay, and somebody has financial gain, I ask you to reconsider this, okay, put it on the shelf, find out what's going on, ask some questions, okay. I know you people are here as volunteers, and you work, I, I sat through several of your meetings, and I sat through videos of others. I, I appreciate the effort you put in, and there's always going to be Somebody, two people come in, I want this, I don't want this, and there's always going to be somebody upset. I mean, and I know that you have to sort of deal with that too. But this goes way beyond that. It goes way beyond that. Okay, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody else with comments uh, not related to the hearings that we have for tonight? Oh, excuse me. Could I get a response on the two letters of appeal that I sent? We discussed it the next week. That's where I'd like. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? No. <clears throat> can I, Mark, before we start the meeting, can I just ask briefly, uh, <coughs> Carolyn, I, I read Mr. Kaline's letter fairly carefully, and it makes obviously a huge number of allegations. I haven't a clue what's accurate and what isn't, but <coughs> is there any response or anything pending or what does the planning department say about it all or is that too big a subject to even ask about? Um, it's not too big of a subject to ask. I don't think there's a big answer necessarily. I think the first letter came, um, it was just a memo so it's not an appeal. An appeal is an official action right. taken in court. You so there's that. no There's no pending appeal. Pending. There's nothing that's been appealed. No. So um, <clears throat> This week, at the beginning of the week, um, Mr. Um, Kaling submitted, um, Callahan submitted um, the second letter that he was referencing. And when I, I immediately emailed him, so that was on Monday, to let him know that there wasn't an appeal because the appeal procedure doesn't, the, P, the planning board doesn't hear an appeal to itself. <laughs> the appeal has to go somewhere else. So I clarified that. Um, but he didn't respond to my email at all. So, um, uh, but I, I just wanted to make sure he understood what the, that process was. Um, but no, there are a lot of, uh, there was, I mean, clearly there's a lot of information in the memo that um, has come from different bits and pieces and hasn't really been, um, it is, is confusing because there were lots of parts to this project. but. As you know, the, the whole cluster development was part of a, over, I think, 117 acres to, to begin with to create the 10 lots. Um, so there's, um, I think, just a lot of misunderstanding about the project itself. And certainly I remember when we were hearing about the kind of moving of a couple of the affordable right. housing lots across the street and it was pretty straight out that they were being moved over to this new little right. area. So. Yeah. So that too, you know, wasn't yeah. a secret meeting at all. Right. It was a public hearing. Although that may have been maybe one of the meetings he claims he was never notified about. I mean, I'm not suggesting we get into it. Just big discussion. Yeah. I just yeah. don't. I feel bad. I mean, he obviously has put a huge amount of time in in right. good faith, even right. if he's wrong. I, I don't know, but feels like he's entitled in some way to some response maybe right well that was my response in email mm -hmm. so um and asked him you know I asked him to you know give me a call if he wanted more clarification so what he just asked for tonight that for us to appeal his appeal we're not the board that he should be appealing right there's a formal to. process and that's not it by asking for us to appeal right so there's a right. formal process yeah. and you appeal it but you don't appeal it to the board that that made the original that made the original <laughs> board, he hasn't got that clarification for whatever reason well that's what i sent to him earlier right. in the week yeah is yeah. it anybody i mean 
is it any violation of open meeting laws for you to CC us on that so that we know what has been communicated to him in terms of what that appeal process is so that I mean because I, I mean, I'm assuming everybody else did too I got letters at my home yeah it, it, it's a little worrisome the thought of being you know could, I mean we're not free as I understand it to, to speak with him about it if, if he sees us on the street or whatever I, I would well, like to be able to know that like he got like and say that that he got the appeal but that I know what appeal process in, from, in education he got um, yeah I can see see you the email but it's not gonna I mean I could so first let me take a step back there's no violation of open meeting because right. the permits done right. you, sure closed, so can you can talk to anybody about anything about that process mm -hmm. um, um, and I can certainly send you the email that I sent um, he had come into our office many times to get information and to ask for addresses for current planning board members past planning board members and we tried to clarify at that point that past planning board members don't play a role in any decisions it's just the board members that are sitting um, but then of course after each decision a postcard is sent to the um, abutters indicating you know clearly what the appeal dates are when they start when they finish and then what sections of state statute you appeal under so no we don't go through a long laundry list of how the steps you take but it's listed there under the state statute how you make that appeal okay so, great. Uh, yeah it would just be helpful yeah to, and that goes to everybody yeah right. yeah wasn't there some issue though that he believed he was in a butter but maybe didn't fall within the, the notice requirement that he personally or a number of people he was speaking on behalf of yeah, that was so he was, right, right. That, so he um, actually was notified even though he's technically not a party of interest under the state um, statute but because we notify more people than who are technically required to be notified mm -hmm. um, but on the maybe the I don't know but the he, he was outside of that notification requirement for the Emerson Way piece so um, he did not get personal notification of that although we have the yellow signs to sort of to have to be posted on the public way so if anyone who's mm -hmm. interested about stuff going on gets noticed that way but um, so I don't know if he was refer referencing that as related to the secret meeting claim yeah um, but he was definitely outside the um, notification um, ring for that one You ready, you ready for this, James? Yeah, I know. I we haven't started yet. So. Uh, okay, let's start uh, tonight. So we have our first <coughs> hearing is scheduled for 7 o'clock for Pioneer Habitat for Humanity for a special permit amendment to waive tree replacement for purposes of providing solar access to a residence for 115 Glendale Road, map ID 42-179. And do we have somebody yes. to speak on that? I'm Megan McDonough, I'm the Executive Director of Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity. Um, and I previously came before the board for, this is a four unit development and three of the houses share a common driveway. And then this fourth house uh, is on its own frontage lot on, on Glendale Road. Um, we thought this lot we would be building on much later, but we got to it sooner than we had anticipated. Um, so I had, I'm coming with the same request that I had for the back lots, which is that we cut down, a, it's a, was pine forest essentially, so we cut down a number of large trees to make a space for this solar zero energy house that we're going to be building. And two of those are to the south of the house, so it would have blocked solar access. And under the tree replacement bylaw, there is an exemption for the tree replacement requirement if the reason you're cutting it down is for solar access for a zero net energy house and there's also a public benefit like affordable housing and all Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanities homes are um, permanently protected as a form of affordable housing. So um, I submitted documentation that we had from our Hearst Raider that it, it has the potential to reach zero net energy um, with the designs that we have. Um, we had the trees measured and uh, a couple of them were discarded because they were hazard trees which you confirmed with an arborist and 
the remaining trees would have, um, there's 143 inches of breast height diameter of trees that we cut down. And two of those trees, um, which represented 26 inches and 24 inches, were to the south of the house. So we're asking for a reduction in the requirement for replacement trees uh, after removing those two trees from the calculation. The question that the uh, the plan calls it, it, it has the potential for the buildings to be net zero. Mm -hmm. um, does that mean they could if we if we designed it that way? But but it gives you an out maybe not to design it that way, or is, is it designed for net zero? And if these trees come down, it will be net zero. Uh, we designed it for net zero. I always couch that language a little bit because it depends on the occupants of the house. Right. So we should be able to achieve a home energy rating index at the time of construction completion um, that's net zero, but I can't promise that the homeowner will live in it right. in a way that's net zero. Right. Um, and we have applied for a building permit with uh, the designs for the energy efficiency level that we're talking about. Um, I'm sorry, this is a clarification. So, so, yeah. so if someone, you, you're supposed to live in the house a particular way to get net zero? So, so net zero just means that you're going to generate as much electricity yeah. as you use. Yeah, that, that part. So if you're someone who has six fish tanks and 20 big screen TVs and likes the height at 80 degrees, even if you have solar panels, it's not going to be net zero. But, but if someone does an average... That's what the home energy rating is yeah. for. It's sort of a, it's an average, so it's a calculation of an average user with average set points using the actual energy features of that house. Um, so the efficiency of the equipment that we're installing, the insulation levels, the air tightness of the building, and they're modeling that, okay, an average user could make this net zero. So when all of that is contingent or dependent upon having these solar arrays. Right. So the solar arrays will be constructed it will be verified right at the time of a build an occupancy permit. Yep, and right. I included a letter from PD Squared, which is the solar installation company that we plan to work with and has worked with us on the other lots on this property. Have we in the past, just to follow up on what George was saying, made it a condition that I mean to me this meets the the, the two exemptions are <coughs> net zero and affordable housing, which this checks off both of those boxes, but for the sake of argument, if we cut the tree down and then something happens and they decide not to pursue PV. Um, so we can, yeah. So you can make that a condition. Then they would just have to do the tree replacement, essentially. Right, so you're waiving right. it. They're waiving, you're ask, they're asking a waiver from replacing trees because they're going to accomplish this net zero. Right. Um, and if they decide not to install the solar panels and they can't get there, then that means they have to do tree replacement. The, so, but the design has solar panels right. on it, and so would we need to make that a condition, or if they decided not to do that, they'd have to come back and ask for a change? Well, good question. Um, probably the latter, actually, because if they didn't, if, you, if you're right, if they didn't, right, so for you, yeah, we just you're leave approving it the plan that, right. that has the solar panels. Okay. On. Yeah. Okay. Any questions from the board? So, for the last, well, the last time this came. We let it go forward because of the two. The two, uh, it met both requirements, right? I feel like I'm just trying to remember what we yeah. did for the last, because I feel like we had this debate about the tree versus kind of the, the solar panel. Right. But in this situation, since two versus one, <coughs> you said yes. Right. right. Okay. Any other questions by the board? Okay, we'll leave this open. Um, we'll just take any public comment. Is anybody here from the public who wishes to comment on this? No? Okay. Any discussion about it? Like I say, to me, this is this Seems is what we're advocating. Forward. Yeah, these right. are this is why the exemptions are there and it right. meets both of them. So. so I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. Um, second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Okay. Uh, somebody want to make a motion? Another motion. George, you're on the roll. All right. So I'll make a motion to uh, approve Pioneer Habitat for Humanities application for a special permit amendment. 
to waive tree replacement for purpose of providing solar access to a residence at 115 Glendale Road, map ID 4217. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Approved. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, next up is uh, a continuation from October 10 of the request of Benjamin Lewis for 15 residential units at 34 Dewey Court. So the applicant has asked for a withdrawal without prejudice, which means if they want to, they can bring it back. Um, right, they could bring the same plan back within two years mm -hmm. or substantially similar in two years. Without having to do another fee of the homeowner. No, so actually, with prejudice means they can't eat, they can't come That's back right. for two right. years oh. with the same. Plan. They can't come back unless they change oh, the plan true. substantially. Got it. Without That's prejudice true. means no. you, you know they're just they're asking it to be pulled off the table, and if they come back within two years, they come back. Within so if we just withdrew, it's with all with prejudice. With you prejudice, really not coming back. back. Technically, yeah. I mean, that's what I'm saying. If we would just withdrew it, that would just a second. Time. Well, most people would prefer to withdraw without prejudice, okay. just to leave the option. Okay. Yeah. It was just yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, question, Carolyn. Since we spent so many hours listening to this uh, issue, are you free to say what has happened, or is that not something for a public meeting? No, I mean it's it, um, there. You pro you may know maybe from I think you all know already that the z there were two permits. There was a zoning board permit and a planning board permit. The zoning board permit has been appealed. So um, initially, the applicant, uh, and that's why there were several continuations because the applicant was trying to figure out, you know, what to do. So at this point, um, you know, they they are withdrawing um, and trying to sort of sort through that. We do have um, there is a modification. Um, there is an issue in the zoning ordinance that was highlighted in this appeal. So it's a conflict, an internal conflict in the zoning. Um, so, um, the, the, you know, we're going to move forward to correct that conflict because it's basically a circular argument that <laughs> um, sort of negates the whole point of having that section. So, you know, I think that there will be another application potentially. Um, so are they withdrawing the uh, ZDA? They, uh, well, they don't need to because that was decided. So the D No, the appeal. Uh, the, I don't know what they're doing on that front. I have no idea. So they may come back, or more than likely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So moving on, we actually have five minutes. Do we have to vote? Do we have to yes. yes. Sorry. Oh. I move to approve. To withdraw of, <coughs> or do we have to close public hearing? Yeah. Yeah. I moved to close public hearing. Second. Second, George. Any discussion? All in favor? Motion. I move to approve the withdrawal of the permit uh, uh, on Dewey Court uh, without prejudice. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Okay. Uh, thank you. So we have a couple minutes until 7.30, which is the next um, hearing. Do we have any A&Rs? Yes. Um, I have two Are you still here for something else? Here, here. We're just here. I'm sorry, sir? We're just here for Dewey Court to listen as to what's going on. Okay. But I do have a question, if I can ask a question. Sure. Um, so, Carolyn, you said that you're going to be possibly changing some rules so that there would be an issue with this. Will we get notification of that, or how do we find out about these potential changes? Yeah, so actually there was an ordinance amendment submitted to City Council. It's um, not scheduled for public hearing yet because of the whole transition for City Council um, to the new City Council. So um, 
it'll be posted. Um, I can certainly email out the proposed text. It's you know on um, city council. Um, I don't know if it's posted yet, but I can send you the text. Um, that would be great. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Anar. Yes. So. um I don't think they get it that we made a decision. And no. Yeah, we get it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so this is a parcel on William Street that has a hundred, just over a hundred feet of frontage. Um, there's an existing house, actually, that's um, non-conforming for setbacks, and um, on this one side, but they're creating another lot. And actually, nothing can happen on this parcel until the that zoning change, if it goes through city council. <laughs> so basically, there are a lot of parcels in the city that you know are getting are tripped up by this thing. So, um, but anyway, this is a frontage, um, uh, a request to carve off this parcel and um, then keep this. I think this is a three family. It's two or three family. But anyway, there's the minimum frontage. Um, there's an existing um, setback issue here with a bay window that doesn't currently meet the side setback, but they're going to take that bay window off so they can meet the setback. And the same with the driveway. They have to create, they have to show a new driveway to show that they're not using a shared driveway at this point when you create a new lot because the existing driveway is on the other portion of the property. But otherwise, the frontage meets the requirements for um, a new lot. So this recommend, recommendation for approval was pending the ZBA zoning and change. Um, well, actually, um, they can, they're not doing it. They're not proposing any change now. But any that they would have to wait for that to happen before. Okay. So we need a recommendation to approve the AMR on Williams. I move to approve the AMR on Williams. 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 <laughs> I was right. We're right. Yeah. You know, what's right. up with that heading? George is that? Yeah, I'm, I'm confused. So if we're waiting yeah. for this zoning ordinance to change. Why are we even doing this AR now? Well, because Why this is just creating a lot. They can't do anything new on this parcel okay. until the zoning changes. Okay. But they're just creating the lot now. So the zoning change is going to have any impact on the lot. Right, because there's no changes proposed on on the on the structure in the structure right now. But what about the front? Is it zoning no, change the about the size of the front? Is? No. What is the zoning change about? <laughs> it's about um, pre-existing non-conforming lots uh -huh. and um, stru or structures, and there's um, there's a statement that says that you can go to the zoning board for finding if you have these non-conformities. But um, only if you're not making the nonconformity worse, and if you're if it doesn't trigger more parking. So um, in most of these situations, whenever it goes to a finding anyway, it's not creating a, a worse nonconformity. But when you're adding units, necessarily you're adding more parking. Right. And that's anywhere. So even if you add an accessory dwelling to your single-family home, you're required to have one more parking space. So it's just, I mean, it, it affects a lot. Right. Of okay. Weird, it hasn't come up before. Yeah. I know. Well, yeah. I think, yeah. I mean, the only way I can, it's been there since I've been here. So I think we uh, we read and interpreted right over it because um, that's what the zoning board was for. You know, when you have a non conforming situation, that's why you send something to the board because there's a request for a change. So, yeah. Who was it brought to light by the Ellen's yeah. lawyer? Mm -hmm. Who was that? Uh, John McLaughlin. Which John? What development was it that brought Bright to light? The new this doing work. Oh, the new report. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's weird that it hasn't come up. Yeah, right. Um, it's such a common issue. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I feel like parking comes up a lot. Entry <laughs> train. <laughs> <laughs> So this is another A and R on Locust Street. Oh, it's another little not already, but <laughs> um, nothing's changing with the uses. But um, 
It's really just a land swap because there's an encroachment with parking. This is the Northampton area pediatrics is here. This is there's a um, um, uh, I don't know if it's still it was um, Green Mountain. Uh, no, no, it's on the other it side. It wasn't a it wasn't deed restricted affordable housing, but I think it was um, Mass uh, uh, Department of Mental Health like um, group housing here on this side. But um, just. Do do something with this site? You did something with oh, Northampton Area funny. Pediatrics to expand the parking. And so yeah, through exactly. that process, they exactly. realized the survey showed that the driveway access for this was on their property. So they're just correcting it, so giving them the land, basically, that they're already trespassing over. So that's all it is. It's a tiny triangle swap of land in the back of the property. Are you done motion to recommend approval? So recommended. Yeah. <laughs> it's so much second. Like second. Fight, right? I know. <laughs> uh, any discussion? All in favor? Um, did I, I just did I send that? No. Okay. okay, that's all I have for extra. Hold on, let me just check. Are we there? No. We're there. By right. three minutes, we are there. Okay. Uh, let me just go. <coughs> Which is highly unusual. No kidding, no. Yeah, right. Hi. Hi, I'm Justin. Hi, Justin. Hi, Justin. Um, do you have a thumb drive you want to pop in? I do, in? yes. Said, hey, this doesn't make sense before. So while we have a minute, new guy. <laughs> What's your background? What are you what, what are you doing? Oh, right. yeah, that's a big question. I'm not your therapist. What are you doing with your life? When did you develop such a self? Yeah, yeah. How about just since you were 12 years old? Do you guys not get the bar mitzvah? I'm an architect. Uh -huh. And uh, mostly doing work in the art. Cameras. Mostly bigger. Not residential. Not usually residential. Mostly yeah. institutional work. Yeah. So you know your way around these blueprints? Blueprints. Oh, right. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was a blueprint machine in my college, but I don't think it worked. <laughs> uh, yeah. Great. Welcome. Thank you. And if you think the zoning here is complicated, you should try getting something through New York. Yeah. <laughs> I hear parking is a big issue there too. Yeah. But they don't have a good tree replacement yeah. ordinance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just in here yesterday. Oh, and there were trees there. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, we're going to jump into our scheduled 7.30 uh, p.m. hearing for a site plan application by the City of Northampton for a parking lot expansion with solar canopy at the Northampton Fire Station, 26 Carlin Drive, Northampton Map, ID 24B-86. Presentation. Good evening. Hi. I'm Jessica Roberts from Klein Bond, and I am here on behalf of the City of Northampton Department of Central Services. David Pomerantz is here, as well as Dwayne, Fire Chief, City of Northampton. Um, the uh, proposed project is the Fire Rescue Headquarters parking lot improvement <coughs> project in Carlin Drive. 
the fire station original build out is uh, 1998, part of the Harlan Drive subdivision. And in mid November, we submitted a site plan review application, uh, in part because the project requires site plan review as an intermediate project for the creation of six or more parking spaces. The objectives of the project, if you don't mind me reading through these mm -hmm. <laughs> to keep on task, uh, to expand the on site parking to meet current demands, particularly during high volume response times. In, to improve the access to the on-site fuel tank for fire trucks, to create a new backup power supply, including a proposed solar canopy over the parking area and battery storage, and improving stormwater management at the site. And stormwater management is uh, associated with the proposed new impervious area as part of the parking lot expansion. So the existing parcel is two acres, it's zoned highway business. It has frontage on both Carlin Drive and North King Street. We are requesting two waivers as part of the project um, because the parking lot expansion, the, you know, the site is two acres, um, limited areas to expand into, and so that would require a little bit of uh, expansion into the existing uh, tree belt. So we're requesting waivers from the 10 foot tree belt, and then there's also a 12 foot tree belt depth that happens to be mentioned in, in attachment 12. So we've listed that as well. There are um, resource areas at the site, mainly a bordering vegetated wetland on the western portion of the site. The parking lot improvement project will expand into the 100 foot buffer zone, but will not expand into the 10 foot um, no disturbance zone under the CONCOM ordinance and uh, no additional impacts to resource areas are proposed as part of the project. So in front of, the, on the screen, the existing conditions plan, the current parking lot is uh, double stacked, um, two rows of parking stalls. On the, I'll use the mouse here, since I don't have a laser pointer, let's see if this will work. So the existing, uh, Fire department has three curb cuts. Um, the the westernmost curb cut and the central curb cut are the curb cuts that are being discussed as part of this project. And you can see on the existing conditions plan, the stormwater uh, basin will be constructed in this area, but there is an existing bordering vegetated wetland on the western side of the site. We have the 10 foot no disturb area associated with that bordering vegetated wetland with uh, erosion controls here, and we note the 100 foot buffer zone of that stormwater, the uh, sorry, existing bordering vegetated wetland. As part of the parking lot uh, improvements, there is proposed relocation of a um, diesel fuel storage area. So I'll scroll down to our proposed development description. The proposed development expansion is to 64 total parking spaces from what is currently, I believe, 38. Um, this allows for parking for high response times and training. It also provides an improved turning radius for refueling. Right now, um, the uh, ladder trucks and other trucks are pulling up to the diesel fuel station and then backing straight back out into Carlin Drive. So the proposal is to create better circulation for the trucks after they refuel and relocation of that diesel um, tank will allow for that. Stormwater management, as I mentioned, a new stormwater basin to mitigate the impacts of additional impervious area. We are also proposing a new treatment unit on the existing stormwater system to uh, improve stormwater quality in a, an existing drainage swale and drainage line that feeds out to King Street on the eastern portion of the site. And the solar canopy and backup battery system, there is a, the, the project is, is basically occurring um, in under two separate procurements. There's a public bid for the parking lot expansion and the associated stormwater improvements that are depicted on the site plans. And there will be an RFP for a solar developer to procure and install the canopy arrays, the battery backup, and the associated electrical connections. Um, so the RFP will have performance specs for the solar um, and will require
require compliance with site plan approval and applicable zoning regulations, there is a DOR grant to install the battery backup system. So the solar developer is going to fund the purchase and the procurement of the array and the, and the backup system. So just on that top, so the developer, so this won't be a city-owned solar? Yes, it will be. But the developer is going to fund the bill. How does that work? The, uh, the developer will fund the building of the PV array, but it will be a city We'll be responsible for procuring. It'll be a 25-year, possibly 25-year lease, Mark, okay. for the developer to come in. Okay. Um, because of the way the grant is structured uh, and state uh, tax laws for procurement, the developer will come in and basically design a system to the performance standards, uh, provide all the components, most of the grant we have will go towards the battery storage component, not the solar array. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Does that does that second procurement include the structure to to hold the canopy up, or just the panels? Okay. I don't see anything about how do you actually like where are the piers or foundations to hold the canopy up? Like, is that how does that coordinate with the plan? Uh, so the current plan, as far as I understand, is to uh, for both projects to occur in parallel in spring and summer 2020. Mm -hmm. um, as part of the parking lot construction, there would be piers put in so that the racking in the solar canopy could be installed later after the, that those racks are where piers are installed. Yeah, but that eat up all the some of these parking spaces. For the record, uh, Alex Fagan and Time Bond, sorry for late getting here. Um, <coughs> In terms of the solar canopy, so the developer will be responsible for the racking system and the support, but the intent is to coordinate the two contracts so that um, we're not putting in a finished course of pavement prior to you know, those going in. Um, the, the piers will be three foot max diameter, so you can think of them as uh, what you might have for a light pole foundation in the parking lot. So maybe some of the guys with the biggest trucks, guys and girls with the biggest trucks don't want to park in those spots that might have an intermediate support, but it's not gonna actually preclude the parking space. Um, additionally, it depends on the design. We, you know, it'll be a performance design, but they may be able to span those bins. It's not that long of a span, but I don't, I'm not going to commit to that because. How, uh, Carolyn, uh, have we had this before where we're being asked to approve a performance design, which doesn't have the details that David's talking about as far as how, how, how big are these supports going to be? How tall are they? What is this physically going to look like? because it's, it hasn't been designed yet. Yeah. Um, no, you haven't. Um, the one thing that you, I mean, to think about in terms of this project um, is that the um, solar panels actually over a parking lot are allowed by right, number one. <clears throat> so the planning board doesn't necessarily review any um, plans that would come in for covering a parking lot because you'd still need to meet the height limits in that district. The other piece is, is behind the building, so it's not fronting on King Street, so you're not reviewing like the whole package of a building, including solar canopies, which I think would be um, something different if you if, if it were in front of the building, you know, between the building and the street. Um, so, um, you, I think, um, I, I think, and I noted in my staff memo that probably the biggest issue is what's going to be visible from the street. Now, Carlin, it will be visible from Carlin Drive, um, but um, since we allow canopies over a parking lot and you and we have height, um, uh, you know, I think it'd be pretty tall um, in the Highway Business District. Um, but I think the biggest issue is really those the backup battery. Um, area that's actually at the front of the building or essentially visible from King Street which is the main corridor um, in this area so this basically backs up to you know wetlands and then another building behind the strip of wetlands so. so because this is a site plan that special permit if um, we don't have a lot of say with respect to the PV array itself right um, but the battery backup we could or would I mean well, I think you have you want to you you can't deny the project. You can ask for specs on sort of what it looks like. So I think the backup battery is important because it's like you'd want to probably screen it like you'd right. want to screen any other utility bank 
fits in front of a building. Mm -hmm. um, the canopy is interesting. You haven't dealt with this before. Um, however, it, you know, like I said, it's it's um, it is an item that in and of itself is allowed by right without planning board review. Right now, is there only one solar canopy in the city at um, Peter Brown's? Yeah, yeah, um, Commercially, yeah. <coughs> I mean, there are some in residential right. neighborhoods, but, yeah, but yes, commercial. over parking, I think you're right. I think the issue with the canopy is not that it doesn't look good to the neighbors or something. It's more that the design that they're submitting that we're being asked to review is somewhat contingent on the design of this by right piece. Like, like how does like pier that supports like the south end of the central canopy like? coordinate with the fire trucks fueling you know I mean I'm not saying it can't be done with your yeah. plan it just it seems to me not 100% obvious that it just you just drop it in there and, yeah, so and your plan stays the same jumping ahead a little bit here but this would be we're calling this not in the contract because the, the plans themselves are for the parking lot development but this this layout of solar panels would be part of the performance specification given to the solar developer you know mm -hmm. you, you need to have X yield and this is your footprint um, we do show the canopy extending over the relocated. Where's my mouse? There it is. Extending over the relocated fueling island because, by stormwater, for stormwater reasons, we need to provide a canopy over the fuel island. Um, and, and we discussed uh, having a condition where, for whatever reason, that didn't work, that application, the developer would then have to put a more traditional canopy over there to meet that stormwater performance standard. But we would limit them to, to these zones. So your fire truck circulation is from the far curb cut around you know, the parking lot with this piece being high enough for the truck to fit beneath. And I think the height we discussed was 14 feet, which would fit over all of Dwayne's equipment. Um, and that's below the max height for the zone in terms of your, your total height. So that's the footprint that they've got to work with. Correct. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's the, the number of solar panels that, that will in the end be designed because you're going to lose some because of the piers and so forth and depending on where the piers go and how many there are and yeah so your, your piers like the structural design of that will be contingent on what's going on with the soils here how far can they actually span how heavier the panels that they're actually going to procure um, so those piers will will be located um, at the well you can't see paid markings here but you know those those piers will be located you know, right in the in the center lines of, of these, if they're needed in the intermediate spacing, and again, that's going to be very comparable to a light pole foundation in you know, any parking lot that you park in. So that space might have that little restriction on a portion, and that's why you might see a smaller vehicle park in that particular space. But we wouldn't say that the space was eliminated from the layout that we're proposing. The other piece is just to clarify: there's no um, requirement that they build this parking. They're doing this in excess of you, you know to accommodate more vehicles. So it's not there um, the board is not approving uh, or ensuring that there's a minimum number of parking spaces to meet the needs of the fire station right so if there's a loss of parking spaces um, it's not really um, it won't um, neg negatively affect their permit because they're not going to be in violation of the zoning for that so it's interesting what can you First, the need for the solar array and some laudable kind of energy conservation and moves towards sustainability, or the need for more parking, and then yeah, you can ask and the then we said, <laughs> "Wow, what a great opportunity! Maybe we'll do solar." What? Uh, yeah, solar. I, Dave Pomeray of Central Services. Um, the grant that we got initially from DOER was part of our resiliency and climate change adaptation work in the city. Uh, through early work that we had done with emergency services, we identified that North, uh, main fire is the emergency operations center. So any incidents uh, requiring activation of the emergency operations center brings everybody there for various extended periods of time. So we applied for a grant for a solar system with battery backup. Uh, simultaneously, Chief Nichols and I began conversations about where it was going to go. And he said, you know, we are crammed for parking, operations have expanded. And I said, let's see if we can put this together and do the same thing at the same time, two things at the same time. But we did get the grant first from DOER. 
as part of our citywide resiliency efforts. And now we're trying to address other questions simultaneously. Thanks, Tim. So the, the, so then your concern was this battery, the battery that was going in the front of the building? Yeah, because we don't know, we don't know what it looks like and there's no proposed screening. I mean. Go in the back. So I'll talk about that a little bit. We're currently proposing a, a pad area over here. So North King Street is just off this inset plan. This is the southeast corner of the building. So uh, the car dealership is, is right down on this side here. Um, I think it's 1140 square feet it says on the plan. Yep. It's like the area we're effectively asking for to be allowed for this battery system. Um, again, the performance spec would limit the developer to that footprint. Um, we, we selected this location because the mechanical room for the fire station is right here. And the back of diesel generators are right here in the primary electrical service entrance is right there. So it just makes the most sense from an implementation standpoint. We did look briefly at this location. There's a little grass swale in front of the fire station. Um, you know, the, the bays are right here. But that's, in our mind, more kind of in the public eye and disrupts the facade of that building, whereas this corner over here is already screened. You've got a nice set of trees there that are screening that as part of the original landscape of the facility. And we felt we could basically sneak the battery system in, um, require the developer to meet the screening requirements of the, of the zoning bylaw as part of his RFP, and replace, uh, there, there's three trees that are, or two trees, two trees and two trees that are built to the other plant that are in this area, and if he needed them, he would have to put them back when he was done with his installation at a, a, a tree that was a relative maturity, because these are tucked in the back, and we want something tall enough to receive sun and continue to thrive in that location. What does this battery, what does this system look like? I mean, I can see that it's 1,100 square feet. Yep. So they come in, um, they do, they do different things with them. I mean, the if you're out on a just a brownfield site or something, they'll put them in those connex boxes like you see coming off a you know a freight liner. Mm. You don't necessarily want that in this location. The other option is like an outbuilding. It could look like a little shed or something like that that was simply built around the equipment and house the equipment. Um, the, these units have containment in them in case there's ever a, you know bad leak from one of the batteries or something like that. And there's other emergency equipment in there, uh, fire suppression equipment and things. Um, but How yeah, tall are they? I mean, it, not massively tall. I would think this wouldn't exceed. Uh, in my head, I'm looking at like a, a, a shed, you know, and like a like a one story type outbuilding that would be adjacent to this side of the, the fire. Eleven hundred square feet is pretty big outbuilding. It may not need to be. The eleven hundred square feet we wanted to permit the size uh, because it fit, quite frankly, geometrically with the line of the existing landscape over here and the back of the building over there, and we just. We didn't want to make it so constrictive that a solar developer came in and said, well, this is going to be, you know, $50,000 more because i got to buy specialized equipment because we want to make sure there's flexibility there for him to do what he needs. Maybe it's that it's placed, you know, it's placed in this portion of it or it's placed in this portion of it. It's not necessarily committing that this building is going to be the 1140. You know, the pad would be coordinated with the developer as well, right? Yes. So you're going to build a pad to match whatever they need. Yeah. These are typically wall-hung batteries, so it's like... Right, like because, mechanical yeah. room, we have a wall. Yeah, so stuff open, open the door, and you, exactly, we all line right. inside the structure. Behind the existing uh, generator, there's a long alley that's open, and it's grass and paved. I think why couldn't it go behind that generator between the generator and the parking lot? It seemed constrained from the implementation standpoint. It seemed like it might be difficult to get into. Um, I don't know if I have an aerial. Certainly. I mean, right now it's a very clean, aesthetic looking building when you come down there on King Street, the trees, the benches, the firehouse itself, to put this up with a chain link fence to meet, just to meet kind of, to go overboard to help this developer. I would think it could go behind there with the rest of the utilities. It seems to be a watertight room, this, right? No, it's not a Yeah, fence. this is a contained, you know. Right, but we're talking but about screening this watertight yeah. room. Well, no, I think the said. wall is the screen. Did yeah, I so, so, you know, one thing comes to mind is that there is a, <laughs> there is that existing wall, short brick wall that goes right here that ties into the architecture of the building and the fence for, that contains the fire station kind of goes. I mean, 
the screening could be a replica of that wall built in front of this pad area. So maybe it shifts a little bit towards North King Street, but architecturally you have that same look and feel that, that you had in the existing that you're alluding to. So it all could be that, but as a city project, can't, can't the city just ask? That's your, that's right. your job. So we can put restrictions on the city them. to when they put that RFP together <laughs> to put match the yeah. design yeah. Right. criteria on it. That's, that's what we're advocating for is, is a, yeah. essentially a performance condition by the board that says you shall meet you know, the architecture of this building and shall be that, that type of wall screening the enclosure for the battery. So why put it in front, right on King Street, if there's room behind that generator and towards the back of the building? Okay. I think we're saying there's not room. I he think he's saying it seems like, I think it's pretty great. He's, he's saying it, it can come in a lot of different sizes. It could be, you know, eight, eight feet by 12 feet. It could be six feet by six feet. Um, but they don't know what the cost overruns could be what it, if they can constrain their, their uh, yeah. what, if they what unnecessarily needs, constrain it, they could end up with an unanticipated cost overrun. What needs to happen for, the, for you to get it seems like we're, we're helping you get a grant, or they have the grant. Got, have grant. The, got the grant, so I mean, they have to spend the grant. Now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I got that. Um, I mean, because I don't want to put an undue burden, but I guess I'm, I, I still, I'm just wondering if, and I hate to send the fire department back, but I'm just trying to figure out why it can't go in this behind the space is that I mean, if you want to switch 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 if I just address that yeah. the, the, that back alley basically services services the emergency generator back there and that's the only access we have to that so if we put a structure in front of that we won't be able to service that emergency generator that's in the back and then there's also right now there's the, the swale that goes down through there uh, that I think it limits our space it, in the front place when we looked at it uh, it seemed like the ideal place to put it uh, one that it seemed logical to put it where you know the, the services are going to go into the building, but that back alley is really tight back there, and uh, with that swale and that emergency generator, I think it really it hampers you know what we could do. So if we put anything behind the building, we really there's a brick wall in front of that generator. We really just isolated that generator and can't do our annual maintenance and service on it and refueling of it. Where is the generator? It's right behind the building, right. Does this Wait, where is it on the plan? Is it on? The plan? Oh no, we're not showing it. It's, it there's a gap on why the plan. Why? Yeah, I mean, you have like one part of the building and then the other part of the building. Like, why not so, show the whole building? Yeah, we have the parking so lot area, this. and that's surveyed. Right. And um, you know, initially we put solar battery was going to go over there. So it's a very hard to review. Can, can we get? Can we? Is it connected to the internet? Is it? Can we get um, you can't do it from there. Um, uh, I can try to put it up on the screen. Uh, we, you want the street view? Is that what you're looking you for? You can just do the aerial top. Yeah. Like we send everybody to get a perspective of the site. Well, yeah. well Karen's look, uh, looking at this. Is there room in the in the uh, adjacent yeah, yeah. mechanical room for some of this battery storage? Like you can put some on this side of the wall and some on the. I mean, I to limit the size of yeah. the new building. Yeah, right, right now the, the mechanical room is pretty tight. Jim, yeah. what we have in there for equipment, and, and I don't believe we could probably fit what we're gonna, you know, what the design of this solar is gonna be for battery storage. Uh, you, you mentioned a couple trees in the front that if they had to take them down, they'd have to replace them. Yes. Though so that row of double trees it, are some of, if not the most mature trees when we started that implementation marching along King Street. Um, and I would hate to take down those for this building. So were you referencing those trees in particular? There's or? three right here. So there's the double row. Yeah. And then there's, there's this little section's got three trees. That line up with the raised landscape area. It was so it was the those, same. It was those the same maturity, basically. Sure, but they're not in that double. Okay. Yeah, they're not. It's not that front buffer, um, but it is that. It's probably the same plan. It was. It was part of the original build out. So '98, and I don't know how mature they were when they were planted. I, this is hard for me because I, I, I in, in concept, I think it's great doing two things at once. It serves a lot of purposes. It, meet some of the goals we've been advocating but approving something that we haven't seen and we won't see it's a kind of a leap of faith to a developer who we don't know who that's going to be you could condition that you get to review yeah you know, the, 
particularly the battery and the screen. For that well, that's the, yeah, that's you know? the biggest concern. I mean, you, you how big that building's gonna be, what's that building gonna look like, how many trees are gonna come down yeah. before, because of that building. You could condition the developer coming with that, that outbuilding and, and demonstrate to you that it, that it meets the requirements that you're looking for in that, that you can make that can get included in the RFP effectively to make sure it goes in the way that you're envisioning it. Yep, 1,100 feet is 34 by 34. It's a huge building. I mean, a huge me, I, I, honestly, I think that's that's a placeholder for for something uh, that isn't going to be that big. Except that's what we would need. No, I, yeah, right, right. right. Yeah. I think because ge geometrically it lines up nice and neat on the drawings, it's good. It, was, I, the, it I, was kind of the available space, and it was an attempt to make this as flexible as possible. I mean, you know, similarly, the condition could be that those two trees can't come down, and that effectively cuts that space back a little bit, and you know. The, the number stays the same, but if they can't take the trees down, they won't use that last 10 feet of it or 20 feet of it, whatever it is. Does it make sense to continue this and <coughs> give them a chance to come back with well, it? Well, then we can't go to a developer. Yeah. Yeah, we're not going to be able to produce the solar stuff that's that's going to come through the solar RFP, which is not going to be able to go out unless there's a site plan approval in place to start this project. I mean, it, it's a chicken and an egg, and I acknowledge right. well, where you're stuck. It's pretty common to do a feasibility study of some kind before an RFP goes out, so you can get a handle on some of these data points. I mean, that's, that's what's done on most projects. They have feasibility study in terms of yield out here and things like that, and how yeah. that ties into the grant. Um, I mean, there's citywide studies that Chris has led the charge on. Um, mm -hmm. I would imagine in 15 minutes with the solar development, you can get a sense for how big a battery room you need. Or, uh, like this. We have a sense that it'll fit in the space. I, you know, I mean, I, I know you're trying to get it to a point where economics meet minimum footprint. I understand that. Would a building the size uh, 1,140 square feet? It, d is this what's represented? So the trees would remain. But that there's three trees behind. There's a planting bed behind that row of trees, and in that planting bed there are three additional trees that they're talking about. If it's that big, so it'd have to come down. The ones north of the proposed battery backup area? Uh, no. The one on the east. Right on the east. Right so on right on the east of the trees proposed trees area. And see no, these are the trees. One, two, three, right there. My yeah. concern, oh, yeah. if we condition this to look like the existing building, the existing building has a standing seam copper roof. Uh, you know, and so this would be the the most beautiful battery backup storage building <laughs> in the eastern seaboard. Um, but it's right on top of, Carolyn's got the, the view of it, it's right up front. I mean, you could effectively condition that the fence built in front of it matched kind of the architecture with the, the brick fence behind it. It was tall enough so you didn't see the building from North King Street. That's the same condition of the building was. That's a big, a big brick. Yeah. It may only have to be eight feet long. I don't know. It's big enough for someone to walk into. It's not a tall thing. Is there, is there, Chief? Is there signage on King Street? There's, there's a low wall, isn't there? It says North, Northampton Fire Station. Or is, is it? A, is there's a, there's a raised bed in front of the station. Yeah, that's with the name. That's okay. above this area here. To the north of the okay. proposal. I was trying there. to think what, if you, if you had a ten foot wall, you could extend the raised bed or something. Yeah. Another question: Does the RFP or the, the solar calculations does it um, give a range of the output, or are we is it, are you getting constrained to a certain maximum output for the solar that would that would entail taking up all three of those parking areas? So there would be three individual canopies. I think the intent would be yes. The, I mean, the intent would be a minimum yield. Um, and that's the proposal I guess we're, we're kind of bringing forward and so then you would allow the solar developer to put in maximize his you know the amount of money he's going to make during his lease period if there was you know again if there was a condition that it was lesser than then that's up to the board but so for the sake of argument if we limited the size of the battery backup building and that by default limited the size of the PV array yeah um, we could go at it backwards or if it's limited the size of the parking area, then that would in fact dictate kind of the battery backup too. I mean, to me, this is. I don't think it's so proportional because you could have 500 batteries on one solar panel just fills up quickly. Right. I don't think it's one But this is more a site plan for parking, more than.
more than anything, right? Versus the PV, the PV array is just, it's, right. a, it's a separate project, it's a grant that they can do by right, and they're gonna, they're trying to piggyback along this parking uh, site plan review that we're doing. But the only reason we're having this PV discussion is because we can. Well, the battery backup component is also changing the site. It was originally approved for the fire station, mm -hmm. so that's another piece of it. Um, I, you know, I'm, I can't um, seem to bump this pro the the screen up here and put the Google or Street View. But um, I had a question because it appears that wherever this pad is, if you have a, let's say an eight foot tall shed, so if the planning board were to condition that, you know, a brick wall um, needs to screen the building then, and limit the height the building can be, then that can be, you know, maybe the roof of that shed pops up over that brick wall. But, um, but it appears that there are windows for the fire station that are in that um, look out onto this area where the pad is. Is that true? That back corner of the building where we're talking about the so that would be there's a couple exterior faces. I mean, the mechanical space. You take care of the mechanics there. Oh, those are the dark gray. Yeah, yeah. those are you take care. Yeah. Okay. I was. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't. They match the same it. dimension as the windows. So what would happen to those if you put a building in front of them? They'd have fixed. Well, it's like free we, air. We leave a gap as long as, you know, I think it's usually at three foot or something. Okay. Oh, so the building won't be connected. It'll be a standard. It will not be connected. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I actually thought if you could somehow connect it, make it just look like a extension of the building. Yeah. First of all, it takes care of one wall. Um, and use that space. And then you could use, use the space and it might look like it was part of the... Yeah, yeah. now the burden yeah. is going to be hiring an architect and, you know, properly renovating that here. building and getting, yeah. you know, all that stuff as opposed to proposing a site build, uh, uh, you know, an outbuilding that can be handled through site plan. So just something to consider. I mean, that's burden right. back. Would the city spend billions of dollars building this thing and hiring an architect that probably would appreciate maintaining that level of design. Uh, but it sounds like we can we can approve something conditionally and then when there's a plan that the developer comes forward, they can come forward and make another application. Well, but you'd want to be clear about what you want to see in that application um, because you're approving the site plan changes as it relates to the parking, but you want to give guidance on what that enclosure needs to look like so that you're okay, not... We'll come back with a separate application for that enclosure. Yeah, but the PV developer... That part's not quite right, is what I mean. The solar panels are right, but the building and closing right. the right. are not by right. Right. But, but the, if the PV developer is going to be responsible for that building, they need to know what the parameters are going to be. Right. Mm -hmm. So that they can effectively bid on the project. I mean, this, with the potential for for like cost overruns of not being able to sort of predict of doing it along the side, like George suggested, it, I mean, would it, bal would it balance out the, the cost for more extensive architecture and design to make it pretty up front and, and consistent with the I mean I mean I'm just I guess I'm just sort of wondering like yes there's a potential for cost overruns if we put it in a footprint that proves to be stuff optimal but is better with the design of the building and off of King Street what could it just balance out if we end up having if, the, if they end up having to spend more to do a more intensive sort of right. design process and architecture process. Well, I don't think you should decide that on behalf of, um, you know, the, the applicant, I'll say, in this situation. You need to treat it just like any other applicant. So I think you can give, um, as um, the um, engineer said, give um, some performance guidance on what you're going to expect to see. So you could approve the parking lot and the canopy changes in the back that um, the screening for this battery um, backup has to, um, you know, have, if you want it to match the brick, then- And then you, they and decide then for themselves, that's gonna cost us too much money, we're gonna find another solution. Right. right. And you could say you want to see final design showing that you complied with what you said are sort of the design performance requirements before yeah. they file for a building. Well, but <coughs> we can. It seems that we're floundering a bit because we don't have enough information. I mean, right. they need to tell us what they want to do. I mean, another, 
whatever right. it takes so another couple mean, hours of work. Right? Exactly. Uh, they need to tell, tell them. them. I, yeah, that's so a, that's a, to me, it seems that they need to do the work to figure out what will make the project accomplish what they want. And there's so many different options for how they could do that um, battery backup building. But that's the thing. This is this is a design for the parking lot only. It's not nothing about this is the design for the PV array. That won't happen until the RFP goes out to the the solar array designer developer. And so, well, if we, we could, like, aren't we, they applying for to build the battery backup building as shown? They're uh, they're they asking to use that area. <laughs> They just showed a footprint. They right. They're asking well, that that's where it's going to go, but they're not. This isn't a. But it also design. says the size. It shows the location and yeah. the size. Right. So they're basically saying it's it's like um, you review applications uh, frequently where someone has a flag lot and it just has a footprint of a house. That doesn't mean they're going to put that house is going to be that exact footprint. It and it may shift, and that's okay as long as other aspects of the site are addressed. In this case. Um, you know, you'd want to see bit, a bit more than a footprint given the location of this. Um, so, you know, you could approve the plan subject to, you know, um, final sign off of screening of the battery backup and you anticipate that it can't be taller than eight feet or whatever the, whatever you think would be appropriate in this location. And maybe it has to have a brick wall that screens the building, but you know, well, I, mean, say, I think we, if we want to treat this like every other, like every other uh, applicant. Uh, I mean, which a it's not because this is like our city that we that we are paying for. But b, if we are, we would say no. You need to come and show us, give us what, give us some thought of what of what you're talking about, because we would not on. The main street in North of Northampton say, "Hey, we're going to give you a 34 by 34 uh, blank slate. Of course, you can build a wall, which we don't really know what you're talking about, uh, and uh, go to it and come back and tell us what, and we'll say yay or nay." Yeah, I'm not suggesting that you just give them a blank slate. <laughs> I'm saying you get you put the condition on that they have to come back for final approval of this screening. But it has. But here are the minimum things that they need to meet. In prior to implementation, yeah, not not built right. and then oh that's good or that's not. No, good. No, right. In a sense, yeah. those things happen to be in the same application. But I think if we approve the parking lot and say nothing about this and say the solar is not part of this approval, like it's the same thing. Just there's less guidance on how they should come back. Right. Mm -hmm. We're attempting to show you a worst case right. of this right. of this building because if if something other than the three rows, you know, something more than the three rows of solar or the, the footprint we've shown has to occur to facilitate the solar, yeah, they got to march back in here and get approval and, and likely from other boards as well at that point. But um, you know, we're trying to show a worst case scenario here to give the board kind of a maximum site impact perspective, and you know, the more that the more we can get conditioned approval on, the better we can write a performance RFP for a solar developer to come in here. So. Given this is a parking lot application, really, uh, I have a couple of questions about the parking lot. Can you flip to the screen that shows the underneath? I would love to talk parking. Great. <laughs> what is parking? Um, so first of all, you have 34, I think, now, and this is going to be 68. I think. Yes. So wh where do these numbers come from? Like, how did, how did you come up with this? Is that's what fit on the lot, so that's what we got, 68? Yeah. Was it 68? I don't know. Yeah, I'm just squinting. 62? 62, okay. Because was there any study done saying like 54 would work? Because part of it is, is there's sort of a little bit of circular logic of we need this many spaces because that's what's fit in the pack. But if you actually don't need 62, you need 54, you, you could put the battery. You know, I know that the mechanical room's not there and all those things, but. Yeah, we, we, I mean, was there any? The directive, of? the directive really was to maximize parking because, quite frankly, it's not going to be enough, but this is what the site can bear. Okay. Um, there's it, no documentation of like why that's not enough or like, there's no, there's I, no I, parking, I understand there's more events happening and lots of programming and there's no parking and study. What's going on, you know, in addition to the emergency center being here, so yeah. in, in those, you know, off situations, yeah, you need a bunch of parking, and in that case, sure, should be parking is fine because there's a critical function going on here, but. Um, there's a lot more regional trainings now. Northampton Fire Rescue is really supporting the surrounding communities. Right, but it's just actually solving that. I mean, are we still going to have issues with 
firemen parking in the neighboring lots and all those things even with this? Do we have any sense of that? That's what I'm asking. With, with the expansion? With the like with this expansion, does that solve the issue that you're saying? Yeah, that gives us the increased parking that we need. It, it, it's not, right right now with just everyday functions going on where the, the parking lot's probably almost three quarters capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, when we have you know large scale events in the city emergencies, uh, that's where we really run into problems. And then, then we do host trainings. Uh, we do try to do trainings for our people and bring them back. And, and that, those are the situations where we're running into that we, we just don't have the parking uh, available. Right. So people. for those, do you have any state, like any sense of training. like what those numbers are? I assume for city emergencies, you can park at King Street if it's an emergency. Right? I mean, I mean, it, but it's not ideal for us to park there. Uh, and sure. But like this being the, the fire station is an emergency operation center. Uh, a, a lot of the solar array came out of that 2011 snowstorm where we lost power for five days in the city. Uh, it was really to give us some resiliency and backup because we worked basically off a generator for six days out of that station uh, running the emergency operations in the city. Uh, so kind of with that solar array and then having the number of people that we need to bring in for that where we really ask uh, every department to kind of send a representative. Uh, we're staffed up, we have dispatch in there uh, it, it really needs to hold those people. Uh, right. I mean, I think. What is the number, though? How, like how? So if it's three quarters full on an at, on a usual basis, yeah. and then there's an emergency, so that remaining quarter is filled up. How much more do do you need, and does this meet that need? That, that 64 would give us plenty for those large scale events that we need. Okay. So a, a, a parking space is 18 feet deep by eight or nine feet wide. Nine in this case, yep. Nine. So if you have four parking spaces, two back to back, so you're at 20, 40 by, so you've got a 800 square foot space with four parking spaces. Could a building of that size, if you lost four parking spaces, if you had 60 instead of 64, and we put a building of that size somewhere in the parking lot where it physically makes sense, so it's not on King Street, would, would losing four tilt the scales as far as parking and functionality and so forth. And it, it, would, it, much it wouldn't, tilt, right. it, it wouldn't that? tilt it that much, Mark. Uh, I mean, if that's where it needs to go, that's where it needs to go. I think we're, we're really looking at moving the batteries up so that, you know, they would be up by the building where the, uh, the service ends. I mean, physically service. that makes sense. I yeah. get I get that. Um, it seems like, it, what, what's the space just to the south of the handicap spots? Uh, there's garages there, mechanic space. That's an access to yeah, that three mechanic space there. There's an entrance to the building here. There's a communications tower. That's what those dots are. Those are mechanic space. Those are bollards protecting. Yeah. I see. And then um, there's another set of double doors here. Mm -hmm. Another door over back here on the alley. There's emergency <laughs> equipment parked in the alley. Uh, Stormwater infrastructure along this road. <coughs> Quite a bit going on. Yeah. Unfortunately. So with so this pad, it's an egg, the egg grade pad for fueling the truck, right? This sort yes. of rounded corner thing? Right here, yep. That's what, so the truck would park there and fuel off the box? The truck would pull in, right. the curb cut, and pull over. Now, some of the trucks are on a passenger side, some are driver's side fuel tank, just like any other vehicle, you know. So, yeah, I mean, it works from a turning radius for them to come in this way as well. So they could come in either which way, quite frankly, but they would sit on this concrete pad and fuel up from that. What's the, what's the frequency of that refueling? No, I guess that's a good question for you. Uh, with our ambulances, daily. So when there's someone parked there to refuel, and you're parked in one of the last three rows of parking, how do you get out? You got to... Right right now? No, and under this plan. It, it's, we should have circulation right around the outside of the parking lot. So, I mean, you can, you can get around the, the vehicle. There's 12 foot minimum here. You know, the, somebody needs to get out from one of these three is what you're referring to. You know, they can go around that vehicle to get out of the parking lot. I, I think the other thing I understand about the fueling operations is really a shift chore, right? I mean, guys are already at the station. There's nobody coming in at that moment. Okay. They're fueling up there in that space. You know, when shift changes are going on, they don't have equipment there fueling and stuff like that because it's, it's just something they're doing while they're on shift or after a call or, or something like that. So, you know, the nature of the fire station operations does change us a little bit from what some of the normal parking lot considerations. Like I understand that the concept of having a vehicle pointing the wrong way, partially obstructing the lane, but um, the frequency of that being an actual conflict is going to be very minimal. Um, so there's a, a large issue about the larger ladder trucks having to back out onto Carlin Drive, but those don't fuel as often. Usually it is the ambulances and the 
perhaps the, your own vehicle, things like that, right? The, the fire. It, it, right now, the, the ladder truck and, uh, and our newer engines uh, are backing out just because the, uh, the curb cuts, the granite curbs, yep. we can't make the swing back in there. Yep. Uh, that's and, what we're struggling with. And they'll be able to make the swing in the future with this layout. That's, that's what he tells All me. All the way around. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I get the sense that there's a desire to approve this, but there's a hesitancy because of all the unknowns, and I'm wondering if there's a compromise somewhere. Well, it sounds that the, it sounds the applicant's pretty willing to lose four spaces. That's, if the issue is kind of the architectural considerations of disturbing that frontage on North King Street, it, it sounds like the four parking spaces could be the, could be the condition. I mean, to me, that's still a pretty good sized footprint, and I, I don't think the battery storage will take need that much right and effectively if it needs more they come back and, they talk right. about and it's so much cheaper i mean they don't they don't have to have as you said whatever copper right it's copper to see. yeah yeah <laughs> well they've got a trench back to the equipment room but right they're, they're trenching anywhere to get these can we are the batteries to the yeah. yeah there's a conduit in this yeah sort so of design. we're taking the conduit to the socket line you know, kind of being proper about what's in the contract, but it's not in all likelihood the same general contractor will run that conduit right. all the way to the mechanical room and then they'll trash back behind the building. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I don't want to lose the parking discussion yet, um, adding these extra 34 spaces because of these events that happen not too often. I, I, I appreciate we have large scale regional training events, but I think what we try to do in the city more and more is to have these shared parking situations. And currently, that's what you have with other lots on Carlin Drive, I think. Um, so I, I'm not sure that it really justifies 34 more spaces. Uh, I was there twice during the week, and today, half of the spaces were empty, which you say happens during shift change. And another time, um, not quite half, but 14 of the spaces were empty. So, and I know when shift comes in, that would be how many men are on, or men and women are on in a shift. There's a change that happens, and maybe we're talking 40 personnel, some leaving, come, some coming in. That's probably a lot. I think um, I think between dispatch and us uh, at shift change, it's it's probably 38, 40 people. Okay, all right. So, and they currently have 34 spaces, so a little bit more. So, I I personally am not crazy about having 34 more spaces here and going right into that wetlands area. Um, and I think we're trying to more and more talk about limiting parking lots, um, parking lots and try to move employees, especially city employees, to more creative ways of getting to work, perhaps, rather than always being in a single occupancy vehicle and even own parking space. Um, so I'd just like to raise that before we talk about just eliminating I, four spaces. I agree with that, but at the same time, this would be the, the first city-owned parking lot with a PV canopy. But, they could still put PV canopies over grass. We've done that in plenty of areas. Most solar arrays are just in a field over grass. Well, and okay. that would help the, the whole wetlands, the, the, the mitigation for that. I, I think it's, I mean, it's a little tough with the, the particular employees that are doing this though, because they're working 24 hour, 36 hour shifts. They're coming in at hour hours of the night when public transportation is not gonna be readily available. They're gonna need to be coming in on an emergency basis. Um, I yeah. This, I mean, this isn't somebody people coming in for a nine to five yeah. well, job. Well, there are occasions when they come in on emergency times, but it is pretty much a nine to five job. Maybe if you work in ten hour shifts, there are occasions when they come in for emergencies, but mostly they're on duty. They're not calling in on a regular basis. All these extra yeah, calls. but they're not on call nine to five. I mean, that's not the nature of of no no. But they're on call seven to seven. It's right. still. Are we so, really impinging on those wetlands? Well, let's talk. We didn't even really get to that that land, that swale there, and the rain gardens, so to speak. So, I'd like to talk about that for a minute. Cause well, it, well, let's see. Can we go back to the number of parking places yep. for a second? Didn't I hear you say that you could live with four fewer parking places, and yeah. that would take care of the issue? It would take care of, of yeah this this issue over of here of the uh, battery backup area. Right. Yes, sir. So that solves our problem. Right there. Well, unless the yeah, if, if parking's not an issue, right? I, I, so I don't know if that's a, a, a continuation and say take that fourteen hundred or twelve hundred square foot footprint and put it somewhere in the parking lot, and if it if it goes down to eight hundred square feet or whatever you think, you know, uh, just um, 
from an architectural sense will work and where it should land and then come back and say it still meets the flows of the trucks everybody can move but it's not on King Street and then if parking if the parking lot itself isn't an issue it, whether it's four spaces or five or six whatever how so then that would free up our approval the second time around for the future developer it would clean up a lot of issues that we have aesthetically on King Street um, and then the only issues what's up and the trees would take all, all that would go away uh, and then we just have to discuss the concerns and, and it could even be built partially on the um, on the grass islands peninsulas whatever they are mm -hmm. to maybe only give up a couple parking places is there a way that the board could conditionally approve effectively that the solar power battery is not over there and there could be an administrative review to confirm that the bid plan you know was not advertising a solar area over there that it was a four parking space footprint kind of in the ideal location of one of these three parking rows I thought, I thought that's what you yeah rather than yeah, yeah than he, he, he said, he said a continuation yeah yeah so I, we would we condition that now and say subject to approval find a better home for that footprint somewhere in the parking lot. Right, if it's in the parking lot, it's going to be under the canopy anyway. Yeah, right. You know, that's sort of covered. Yeah. I think that you're, I think that's a, um, an easier thing to do um, just as a condition. The backup battery shall be in the parking lot. Um, and it maybe doesn't even matter to say how many spaces it's allowed to take right. up. Right, right. It's however, um, it's however, however many, many need. yeah, it needs. And then, and then it's it just as long as it's not up against the Carlin Drive, you know, end of the parking lot, maybe, um, because that's another sort of it, that's where the um, tree belt is there. Would we, would we, or could we say um, it must architecturally complement the existing building and? In, in Give us a little wiggle room, or do we have to say it has to have the same brick? Or whatever. Think, at that point, I would say it doesn't need to because it's in the middle of a parking lot behind a solar canopy, and it's not next to that building. So I think the issue of being right next to the building on the front of King Street, then I think that's more of an issue about matching architectural details of that. When you're getting in the parking lot, you've got the fueling tank, you've got the you know the canopy. There's all sorts of things that are not like the building. So I think at that point. It almost it disappears yeah. by itself without having yeah. to worry about that. And they can put yeah. they can yeah. do a shed that's yeah, like just one, an off the shelf. A white vinyl sided you know <laughs> box or something like that. So, so that, that might be. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of funky stuff on the south and yeah. west of this village that I've seen in these drawings. Yeah. That that you would it would just be another one of those. Right. Like, yeah. <laughs> you could do a comics box back there if no one would notice. I don't think. Yeah. So I, I think that's. Um, I, I mean, I certainly would um, advise that that's an appropriate way to deal with it as opposed to requiring it. It makes it easier for right. me to yeah. get. get rolling yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then the and then in terms of the wetlands piece, they do still need to go to the Conservation Commission. They did, um, DPW did review it for stormwater, so it's meeting stormwater standards for, um, um, you know, the, the runoff that's coming off the site. Um, Conservation Commission won't be able to get to it until they can see the wetland boundary because there's snow out there now. So we will meet with them on January 9th, but yes, Sarah <laughs> cannot confirm the wetland delineation until there's no snow, which right. obviously this time of year, who knows? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Did you have any other comments? Um, they did, I but it was mostly about getting final You can plans. see the flags there. Come on. Um, so um, it's just, um, they essentially there were some questions about where the final location of the fueling station were going to be. Um, and um, so they want to see revised plans. So their standard, that's the, um, their standard condition is, you know, 30 days prior to issuance of building permit, they want stamped plans showing, you know, the details for the items that weren't there, the utility connections, the, the backup battery, the solar canopy, um, that kind of thing. So, um, uh, so that's it. They were they did submit revised plans today to address a lot of the other DPW comments that DPW had up to this point, but those have been um, addressed. And to be clear, these are the revised plans that are on the slides. So you're seeing what we submitted today. George. So a um, couple of so currently where the retention pond is going, let's call it that. I'm not sure what's called on your wetlands plan, but. Uh, you recommended taking down about five pretty large trees 
Yes. Um, and there's the city's paying into their own mitigation, where there's no requirement there for. So yeah, it's it's a bit odd with the solar canopy going in. There's no direct requirement to mitigate for the new parking spaces, which would typically be the tree placements. Yeah. Um, the, the trees were obviously part of the original landscape of this building. Um, effectively, there's no good place to put them, especially if you're going to put the solar in, because you can't shade the solar and you're not going to get any yield. Yeah. Um, if it is a concern of the board, then some mechanism like that, whether it would be trees on other city properties, paid into the mitigation fund, something along those lines would, would have to be the approach. Because, I, I mean, spatially, there's just nowhere to put them on this site, uh, especially with the solar there. Um. So on, on top of taking down those five trees, it looks like you're also clear cutting almost all the way to the 10 foot buffer. So if folks have seen that, there's a lot of trees still in there beside those just five. So they're they're clear cutting right up to the wetlands line pretty much. So it's being regraded. Huh? Because that's being regraded, right? Yeah, yeah. So what I'm suggesting is, is that if we reduce some of that 10 foot, uh, some of that uh, parking, the retention pond could come back this way all of that buffer land wouldn't have to be taken out and cut down. You would have more, you know, again, I'm, I'm erring on the side of the Conservation Commission's language now. Yeah, so, so the Conservation Commission in this Highway Business Zoning District has a 10-foot protected zone yep. on the wetland, which we've effectively honored with the, with the plan. Yeah, you're right. In the proper buffer zone, there are additional tree impacts and things like that, and, and you know, so, so the ATO deliberations on that. But we are out of the 10-foot protected zone that is uh, by the city, you know, a no trespass. Yeah. And the Wellness Protection Act allows you up to the one inch line effectively. So, George, you can't, you can't really just take off 10 feet because parking comes in 60 right. foot chunks basically. So you're going to lose a whole aisle of well, if you do that. Exactly. So, so that's what I'm be up to the, the conscom to make that call? But it'd be up to us to say we could lose an aisle of parking, which would be nine spaces on well, that two. side. It would really, what well, they could say. Then in addition to the four that we're suggesting, people come to I, I, we're basically saying no to their application. No, we're not saying no, we're conditioning it. Again, we have to look at these parking lots all across the city and how much we're providing for spaces that really remain empty. They're, they're, they're losing all of their open space here. Um, and so many of the parking spaces for 80% of the time are unused. So I, could I, I we've been talking, here's the parking study, I apologize for being clear, but uh, we discussed um, 38 vehicles during shift change, kind of the max daily operation. Um, the training room holds 25. So right there, that's 63 parking spaces. But the trainings are not, it's not once a year. These are, these are once a month. It, it's once a month, once yeah. every other month. It's probably six, eight times a year. So. It, it's, it's a regular occurrence, frequency, not daily. It's a regular occurrence, and you're dealing with people coming from other communities, so you're not gonna be leveraging any busing or anything like that, unfortunately. Um, you know, and then it's a fire station, so that bell rings, and they're calling three more people in. You know, So during a training, it's likely you're gonna have somebody coming in to supplement a shift as well. So uh, 64 actually is a pretty good number for, for the, you know, the need. It, it's the board's discretion if you feel that all of that is not warranted, but um, is it open to a public to to park there? For instance, of the physical therapy across the street that oftentimes gets filled up. Are they allowed to go into that overflow? The visitor, up? right? Staff and visitor. It, it, it's staff and visitors. Uh, right, right now we have two uh, electrical charging units that, in all honesty, are used by people. I've seen them in the morning. I've seen the so, gym people go over, park their car, yeah. So th those get their bags out, and then they go to yeah. the gym. <laughs> which I didn't know if it was. Yeah. or not legal but, but those two spots are, are used exactly that way they're, yeah, they're used all day from probably 6 a.m. till probably 8 9 o'clock at night I, I mean I, I, get parking. I mean I would argue that they need the parking because when I go there people are circling NAC and I go to the physical therapist and I'm circling constantly sometimes I park in the dirt lot to walk in so I don't know if you monitor her or not but in theory there is a lack of parking with those two buildings, so if somebody trickled into this thing and they were going to get ticketed, towed, or yeah, we, we don't. I mean, we don't actively you know right. go out and move people. I've yeah. seen people yeah. park there, but but the reverse is also true, which is if they have a parking crunch at the at fire station, right. then it, there isn't really overflow 
parking available, or certainly depending on the time of day, um, at the at the. They're not going to the NAC department, right? The, or the, 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 the dirt, so. that dirt parking lot that you use is what everybody uses. And the firemen walk from private there all to the station. Yes. Yeah, that, Just like a, you walk. Yeah, that. that's a privately owned lot. That it's, a, it's essentially a trespass to be parking on that lot. It, it's used, you're correct, because they have to right. park somewhere. Right, they have no parking. Exactly. Yeah. But right. I'll, I'll, just to my board members, I'll say that the city is moving forward on this huge sustainability plan, and we're going to be asking residents and businesses to really look at you know, the usage of cars and vehicles and so if we're asking all of our other businesses and residents you know we have to really ask our city departments to look at that too that, that's all i'm saying this is going to come up time and time again i, I want to disagree with that i, I don't think yeah. asking for emergency staff to it's a different type of requirement i think if people are going to get bagels or go walk on the treadmill asking them to go walk or take the bus or bike that makes a lot of sense it does not make sense for firemen i'm sorry i can't i agree with overall what you said except that it's emergency Services. They have a lot of gear that they got to bring. Okay. Right. And I guarantee you, I, 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 I think that it, this was driven by need. So they said we, we've got an opportunity to have more parking. How much parking can we fit here? And that's what this right. design yeah. reflects is the maximum. But now if we say, can't put the building here, it's going to be ugly on King Street, push it back there. Maybe we address the big five trees and there's some sort of mitigation to pay into the fund. There's no space to put it on the lot, but maybe we put those. The value of those trees somewhere else which we've done in the past so we you know we address some of the things that that are important to the board but at the same time the city the emergency services are able to address a, a real need I'm just wondering uh, you know if if we are if, if this thing is going in the back and they when we say you're um, it can go go anywhere except for you know, on the Is that front. the place you said you wanted right. to put it? <laughs> <laughs> That's That's the place said, yeah. Except yeah. for the front and, you know, Probably. potentially this side. Um, I'm just, and it, and it was in the back. I'm just wondering if naturally they're going to lose more than four, four spaces and that would sort of solve, solve the issue. I mean, if this is, mm -hmm. if, it, if they're putting us in the back, I guess they're not going to put it in the back, they're going to put it in the front. Yeah, yeah. But the sustainability yeah. issue is not yeah. that we don't want parking spaces, you want more pervious. Yes. Yeah. And then this building's not. Okay. You know, water doesn't sink yeah. away in that way. Make it yes. pervious. It's, it's, a good comment. <laughs> it's a good comment about, yeah, we may end up losing more parking. I guess what we're asking is for you to approve 64 parking spaces. And obviously, we would not go below the minimum number of parking spaces. You know, there may be after some solar feasibility justification of need to take up eight, not four. And to your point, then you're losing them. But if the planning board grants the flexibility to say you can have a 64 parking space lot, which we can't because we got to put the battery somewhere at this point, but if you can have that impervious area, then we can probably make the rest work through performance spec of the RFP. Mm -hmm. And there may be a creative solar developer who can hang all the batteries on the side of the building. You never know. You never know. You never know. Yeah, I. I I don't think we can, this is a fundamental municipal institution and I don't think this is the place to start telling people they have to ride their bikes to work. Um, notwithstanding, it's the sort of issue that we deal with and are heading in the direction of. But I, I'm comfortable with approving this and putting the solar backup building in the parking lot and moving forward. So I have a couple of more minuscule things. Yep. You're removing a, a light, the only parking. Are you installing, are you putting another light in the parking lot? Do you have any lighting plans? The solar canopy will be underlit. Mm -hmm. uh, so that'll actually be much better lighting than I have now. And completely cut off, you know, in terms of down the dark sky because right. it's yeah. underneath and it's yep. gapped, so. Yep. You know, there's two big dumpsters there and that basically across from where I think the, the new filling station is going. Are they going to stay there? Is that going to impede the traffic? The dumpster pad, I believe, is just off the side of the pavement down over here. Yeah, yeah we didn't push this curb line down here. This is the existing curb line, and that dumpster pad is just beyond it. So it is? It was, it was, okay. Yep. Yep. Uh, there was a comment from staff uh, about the pedestrian path from the parking lot to the station. There's no clear safe zone for pedestrian movement after you park a car. Has that been addressed or discussed? 
it was discussed. So um, the way we responded to that comment was to say effectively, you don't have the typical, it's kind of what we've been talking about this whole time, you don't have the typical intermixing of pedestrians and vehicles here. You have shifts coming in, shifts going out, and sometimes all day trainings spanning that, that operation. It's not commercial where there's always cars coming in and there's always pet car conflicts. But to try to improve it a little bit, we did in the revised plan clearly demarcate, I can't zoom in anymore, I apologize. We demarcated two visitor parking spaces over here so that if there's anybody coming to the fire station that is not a fire station employee, their parking is effectively right here. All they have to do is cross the drive aisle and they can go through the ADA pedestrian access route. So, so visitors do have a very clear path. You know, the concern about, um, you know, say, firefighters parked over here, yeah, they gotta make their way through the parking lot. Um, to my knowledge, there's no staff complaints to the effect and, and no, no incidents, you know, in the life of the fire station. So, you know, while, while the concern is, is valid from a general site and, and transportation perspective, again, kind of going back it's, to the, the nature of this. Yeah. Yeah. So that visitor parking, that's where the people who are working out at yes. the athletic center will park. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So we actually, we, free electricity yes. we moved the EVs right here too because uh, we needed one more ADA stall to accommodate the total count of parking. So okay. we're moving the EV station here and those are also marked right up in this area. So again, kind of all those uh, VIP spots have clear <laughs> access to the pedestrian accommodation. Do those have, <laughs> not the hard one, but so if, if you want to park in that, that one on the west side, the EV on the west, this guy here. So to get there, you go all the, you come in and you go all the way to the you back. Come in and go in, yeah. So the, one of the, the local fire department vehicle for inspections locally is an EV vehicle. Oh, and really? so I imagine that's where that one will park, uh -huh. you know, most times. I'm just thinking of it's sort of a, an annoyance to the staff to have visitors coming and going, having to go all the way through the parking lot. To get yeah, I mean, we, we could, you know, do you have one, just one EV vehicle? Uh, we actually, just one. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we could uh -huh. say visitor electric vehicle parking <laughs> over here. I mean, the, the staff is used to this. Uh, I, right. I hesitate to call it circulation because well, if the front line's not, empty, a lot of the time they'll just pull through anyway. So. Well, right. And if you're doing a shift change, right? I mean, there's more opportunity for that type of pull through behavior as well. So um, we also added the directional arrows at David Valletta's request, um, which, you know, while it's not like a crosswalk through the parking lot, it does provide more direction to vehicles and more expectation in terms of what a vehicle is doing when they're coming through. So other cell arrays we've uh, permitted, we understand that there's a cell flight for them, and eventually they probably gonna be dismantled, recycled, and we've asked the applicant to provide some kind of escrow for them, I think, in order to make sure that the city's not responsible, the fire department act doesn't have to recycle them themselves. Does that make sense in this situation or for the RFP? I think that uh, you gotta, a 25 year lease most likely. I mean, those details are be worked out. You probably got a 50 year life on the panels. The city is gonna own these and financially benefit from them in the latter stages of their life and therefore would need to decommission them when they were when they were done. Um, so the decommissioning would be by the city, not by the developer. Okay. I'm not the solar guy, quite frankly. We, and unfortunately, I don't have the answer to that one on hand. I don't know if it's common to condition that in an RFP that they have to come back, I doubt it, because I think their responsibility ends at the end of their lease, so. Which won't be their projected life. Exactly, their projected life would exceed, so. Because I, I think it wasn't so much about the panels themselves, but more about the batteries. Right. Well, the batteries for sure, and they yeah. require a particular disposal, just like anything, just with, you know, EV cars, I mean, it's the same issue that you're, you know, you got a life there and a battery that needs to be taken care of, so. But that will all be structured in the RFP. Well, that's what that, that's that what yeah. so yeah. it would it be a burden to the city if, if if we condition so the wording in the RFP uh, required the developer at the end of the useful life of the batteries to to dispose of them properly and not have the city have to do that or does that work that provided it, it yeah. occurs during the right. lease term correct right right I think that should probably be not a condition of the permit but in the, the RFP and I only say that because it is city property, the city would be responsible anyway, so it's not like you're permitting a private developer on the solar array where it's private property. And 
the, you know, essentially you're trying to prevent the city from having to go in and recycle something on private property where this is not public. Because they'll just build it into the cost of the, like the parties right, right. are that much right. more expensive. Right. Yeah. So. right. Since, we'll, since the city will own, is paying with a grant for the battery piece of the solar project, not the panels, the developer will pay for or dispose of the panels. I have to check the award documents from DOER and see what, what conditions they might have set. This is going back a couple of years now, so I'd have to get that the award out and see. Uh, but we can certainly look into that. But I guess it's a moot point because it's city. Uh, mm -hmm. I just think, you know, as we said before, we have to treat every application kind of the same. So we want, we always want to ask all these same questions when it comes to solar, right? Because we're going to see more of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my last question, I hate to bring it up, Alan, but it's never your last question. Chief, is there a bicycle racks on the, on the lot right now? Because some people will come with a bicycle. If not, could we add something here while the yeah, parking lot's here. going under? Yeah, right, right now we currently don't have any good bicycle racks. Do you ever see a bicycle come through the neighborhood? Uh, we, we see it come through. People certainly use the uh, King Street area, and uh, we've seen them occasionally. Could we, could we add them somewhere during? Could you fit them in near that EV place, one of those islands, just even if it's two hoops or four, four bikes? Yeah. Yeah, typically, in the site plan, you know, if we can, we. We talk about trees, we talk about bike racks, things like that. Talk about I mean, it might be appropriate right. to put them, you know, either here or over by the main entrance, but, you know, I, I, you that's can a, decide. But probably everybody uses that's, that's them a, the gym. That's right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, put them closer to the gym. Yeah. <laughs> but that's fine. Um, question just for the board. Um, let me know if you think these are still applicable. These are the, the comments um, from staff, uh, most of which we've already discussed. What does the solar backup look like? We need to detail the equipment and size as well as a detail the proposed screen. So are we collectively saying that if we condition it to have the battery backup in the parking lot footprint, that all that goes away? Yep. And we don't really yeah. care what it looks like because it's in the back, can't see it. Well, as long as it's in the back and not on whatever. Carlin. Carlin. Right. So that can be part of the condition. Yeah. Okay. Number two, what is the pedestrian path? We talked about that. Number three, we need a detail of the PV canopy itself, height, et cetera, given that this is behind the fire station. Um, the height and details may not be so critical, but is that a concern? I thought it had board? to meet a certain thing, Carol. Well, there's a, there, are, there are allowances, yeah. so it, should, it would meet the zoning provisions. I think you have, what, two and a half stories in, in HV? I mean, it's it's tall. And it's so it's have, tall. Are, any, are you familiar with the one at Whalen Insurance? From the very back. That's not two, two and a half, half stories. stories. It's, it's a big boy. Yeah. Have you seen it? There's like, I think it's an REI in, Frame, in Newton or something that has. No, it's a uh, framing. Uh, uh, frame, frame, the mall, yeah. right? Yeah. I think Northampton should be proud to have a big solar array visible on King Street. Uh, King Street's ugly. I mean, Are they the solar array? Right? Really? No, no, not two and a half stories, but I quite. Sorry, but it's more of a sun. I actually don't even know the solar panels. <laughs> 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 but the, com the comment yeah, about the. It'll be the best thing looking thing around. The, the base for the um, the supports is not insubstantial. If, if using the one at Whalen Insurance, since that's the only one, it's, right. it's big. Uh, I mean, there's still parking on either side, but I think between the, the footprint of the battery storage and the need for the, the size of these piers for a, for a canopy this size, you might lose more than four parking spaces. Um, <coughs> but. Yeah, I don't think we should micromanage what the canopy should look like okay. so we're actually technically still in the presentation port portion of our program uh, any other things that you want to talk about that we haven't touched on even listening was there anything else in the PowerPoint that we have not touched on no but I listened to the top of that sheet here right there in case you want to run through the top of that So I would say that, that no, I do not feel we have more to present at this point. I think we've, as long as there aren't specific concerns, we didn't speak directly to um, grading, drainage, and utilities. We, we kind of spoke about storm water and different aspects. You know, there is a plan included here. Um, maybe one thing I would point out briefly is that 
uh, fueling tanks come with, you know, can, fueling tanks come with the inherent spill concern. So yeah. um, we've established the high point for the parking lot is effectively this 150 contour. And we've extended that ridge down to the curb line with a series of high points that descend in elevation. What this ensures is that the um, concrete fueling pad it tips towards the existing stormwater soil. The existing stormwater soil is con constructed with a clay material. So you're not talking about uh, potential fuel being into the ground there like you would with the basin. So we're sending it that way. And then we also agreed in staff comments with Doug McDonald to put in an oil and grit separator before that line discharges at North King Street. So effectively we provided um, containment and secondary containment for potential fuel cell. So, so okay. And um, I think the vehicle that handles fuel spills in Northampton is like parked right here. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that going for you too. But, um, did, did the city reach out to any of the abutters, the car lot, the NAC? Did, did we notify them? Oh. Yeah, as required by yeah. yeah. But you didn't have any conversations with your abutters about this project no. or the solar panels? No, I did not. Okay, so we'll leave this, uh, thank you. Uh, we'll leave this open for a little bit while we talk. Um, so I've got uh, the conditions I have potentially are uh, the DPW comments, uh, the battery backup should be in the parking lot, bike rack, and then we talked but didn't really nail down the, the tree removal mitigation uh, for the five in the back that are coming down. Is there a desire to, how, how does that, the city pay the city? I mean, yeah, that's that, what I was going to that. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, the typically, um, you know, these aren't, none of them are over 20 inches, so there's no tree replacement requirement. It's okay. in site plan. Okay. You, you know, they're, they're taking this out, obviously, including the parking, but they're also, there's an exemption for building solar canopies not to have to plant trees, you know, in the parking lot, obviously, to bring this solar canopy. So it really is very discretional at this point because there's not a tr there's not a requirement that they replace those trees. Okay. Um, Carolyn Hap can also mention there's no requirement to have any open to meet any open space requirements on this parcel. No, there is, but they have the open space because they have the it's 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 um, just through landscaping in the highway they, business district. Yeah. They do. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we talked about the bike rack. How big of a bike rack do we want? Four bikes is plenty. So four loops or two loops? Two loops. Okay. Any other conditions that I have? Is there a basic condition that the parking lot is, maybe this is in the application, is the parking lot only improved if the solar panel happens, if the solar system happens also? Or like say the RP falls through. Yeah. Like so big out. question. Um, if they don't put the solar canopy up, then they're changing the site plan that you approve a piece of that is, you know, we require landscaped islands in between all of those rows of, of parking. Mm -hmm. So if they didn't put the canopy up, they have, to, have to put, they'd have to comply with the parking requirements that um, So would they trigger. have to come back then? Um, or would that be a staff? They would have to come back, um, you know, if they just designed the parking lot with a, um, and, and complied, then they probably wouldn't have to come back. But you already have the grant for the PV array, right? right. right. For so the batteries, yeah. yeah. For the batteries, yes. Yeah. Right. So we need the array to right. use the batteries, right? Yeah. Okay. So it would change the number of the parking spaces okay. if they had an output in an eight-inch tree island. In all those, mm -hmm. that would they right. do something that. Yeah. So if no, for, if nobody responded to the RFP, <coughs> the grant they can't use the grant. The parking lot would have to be modified. They'd have to add those. The yeah. You know where there's um. This is just a side, uh, a side note. But you know where there's a good example of this kind of project is the uh, Franklin County House of Correction has these solar canopies mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So if anybody wants mm -hmm. to check out, I, I think what it might look like. Uh, Been there. You know what? I mean. Uh, okay, any other uh, discussion before we close uh, public comment? I move to close public comment. I second. Second. Any discussion? All in 
favor? So I have uh, three conditions, DPW comments, battery backup in the parking lot, and a two-loop bike rack. So unless there's further discussion, I'm looking for a motion. And, and in the, you said in the back and away from Carl. So it'd be in the footprint of the parking lot away and, and not adjacent to Carl and Drive. I know it's not really public comment, but DPW comments include things that it seems like we've resolved here without change. So, yep. do you want to go through those at all anymore? No. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, yes. I move to uh, approve uh, the expansion of the company lot uh, with the solar battery backup system within uh, within the uh, within its space uh, within the space of the parking lot away from uh, Carl Carl and Drive, Carl and Drive uh, with two with two rings loops two loops uh, and uh, two and, and and the final prize show me yeah, yeah. DW comments Second. Any discussion? Just one real quick one. So I, I just want to say again about our process that this is done a couple of times. The cons, we're going to set our, we're going to approve this and move forward without the cons come having met on this. So if they run into anything, if they make any conditions, say 10 feet isn't enough, it should be 20 feet or 30 feet, that's going to change the footprint of right. our decision. Yep. So I just wish we could work something out with cons come when something is this closest tangible that they would go first before us and make their determination prior to our that's usually the case I mean why it's not I mean it's, it's up to the applicant and right um, David's correct that if it changes the site plan then they have to come back to amend it in front of you so it's up to the applicant which place they go we try to encourage them to come you know that's why we have meetings on the same night so they can theoretically go to conservation yeah. commission the same yeah. day and you have a permit um they filed um after snowfall so they can't um, be put you know the conservation commission can't decide this at this point so they can move forward and they it's really up to the after to decide which way and if it, it hurts them in the back end that they have to come back that's what happens well, I think they go to Coscom and they say, look, we've been approved by the planning department already and this site plan, they love the site plan. It's so approved by you, not the department. The, pla <laughs> <laughs> the planning board, and that gives them kind of this, uh, this gotcha. extra kind of credential, you know? Well, so, wouldn't it be the same the other way? I mean, no, not, well, the other way they would, and they would have to show us in their plans kind of a, a whole different delineation of where that other, um, Stormwater mitigation can go, but I think she's saying that if if, if we approve, if they approve the first, then they're going to say, "Oh, Conscom wants right, it." Right, we should, right, right. Yes. Yeah, but we should probably mention that Conscom should have a backbone and look at it on their own right, merits. Right. Right. I know somebody's got to go first. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thanks for hearing me out. Uh, so we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed. Here we go. Thank you, everybody.